If you're writing your thesis, a conference paper or a journal paper, or even just looking through the CFD user manuals, you may have come across different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations and the other transport equations. Some of the common forms which you might have seen include the Lagrangian derivative form, a conservative form, and an advection form of the same transport equations. And it's often not clear what the differences are between these different forms of the same equation. What I'm going to be doing for you in this talk is going through the different forms of the transport equations so that you understand the differences between them and you can make sure you don't put any typos in your paper when you're writing it out. So if you're going to be writing these equations down, this talk is going to be really useful for you. I'm going to go through all of the different forms. Sit back and let's get into the talk. The easiest way to understand the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations is to start with a simple example. And the example I'm going to use is imagine a swimming pool or a large volume of water. And this volume of water is contained in a container. And for some reason, which we don't need to think about, the pool of water is cold at one end and hot at the other end. So there's a gradient of temperature from one end to the other end of the pool. I'm not considering any boundary layers, heated surfaces, or variation in the vertical direction, just a simple one-dimensional case where we have a cold end at one end and a hot end at the other end. This is the example we're going to use for understanding the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations. And what I want you to think about is placing a temperature sensor of some kind, like a thermometer for example, in the pool at a given location. And in this example, the temperature of the pool itself is not varying with time. So the thermometer will read a constant temperature through time. The pool has a constant temperature. Of course, in reality, there would be some small variations in temperature around the measured value, but I'm not going to be considering those today. All I want you to think about is if we place the sensor somewhere in the pool, the temperature will be constant with time. Now, what happens if we move the sensor? This is the key idea that I want you to think about. If we take that sensor, which is initially at the cold end of the pool, and then move the sensor through the water to the hot end of the pool, I want you to think about physically moving that sensor yourself. And if we look on the screen where the data is shown for what the temperature measures, we will of course see that the measured temperature increases with time because we're moving that sensor from the cold end of the pool all the way through to the hot end of the pool. So even though the temperature of the pool itself is staying constant in time, because we're moving the sensor through the pool, the measured temperature that the sensor sees does change with time. And following that same idea, if we move the sensor faster, so we really move it quickly through the pool, the temperature measured by the sensor will change more rapidly. And you can see that there in the curve. And I really want you to think about you actually doing this yourself, taking the sensor, moving it really fast through the pool, and the temperature trace that you'll see on the screen of the sensor is that the temperature varies more rapidly with time. And we can do a similar thought exercise where if we had two pools, one which is cold at one end and hot at the other end, and then we had a second pool which was a lot colder at one end and a lot hotter at the other end. It has a greater spatial temperature gradient. Then if we move the sensor at the same speed through both of the pools, of course the pool with the steeper temperature gradient is going to see a more rapid change in temperature in time because we're moving through a steeper temperature gradient. And these are the key ideas that I want you to think about. We can actually bring these ideas together with a very simple equation. We want to be thinking about the measured rate of change of temperature. So what is the gradient of temperature that's seen on the screen of the sensor as we move it through the pool? Well, it turns out that if you really think about moving along the spatial temperature gradient in the pool at some velocity u, it turns out that the rate of measured temperature change by the sensor is just going to be equal to the spatial temperature gradient dt dx multiplied by the speed u that we move through the pool. 
And of course you can verify or check this by just looking at the units. DT DT is a units of kelvins per second or degrees per second. And then that's going to be equal to velocity meters per second multiplied by the spatial temperature gradient kelvin per meter. So that's our simple formula. The measured rate of change of temperature with time is going to be equal to the speed multiplied by the spatial temperature gradient. Now that's in one dimension, but what if we took our sensor and moved it in some 3D direction in the pool? If we're not moving from left to right, maybe we move up to down or we move diagonally, can actually extend that previous equation that we had there. dt dt is again going to be equal to the x component of the velocity vector, u, multiplied by dt dx, and then we have the same contributions in the y and z directions as well. But it's the same formula because, of course, you can verify this. If you were to move parallel or move into the screen, so we're not moving in the x direction, but we're moving with some velocity component v, then the measured rate of change of temperature would be equal to the speed that we move in that direction multiplied by the temperature gradient in that direction as well. And we can simplify this equation into vector form by noticing, of course, that u, v, and w are the components of the velocity gradient. And we can rewrite this as the dot product of the velocity vector and the temperature gradient vector there, dt dx, dt dy, and dt dz. And we can also simplify this by rewriting in vector notation using bold u for the velocity vector, nabla for the gradient vector, and then t for the temperature field. So this is our formula, equation four. The measured rate of change of temperature on the screen of the sensor is going to be equal to the dot product u dot nabla and then multiplied by the temperature gradient, the temperature field there. And I wanted to make a quick side point here to be very careful with this formula that you have the order of the dot product the correct way round, because of course the uh, divergence of the velocity field, nabla dot u, if you have an incompressible flow, that's going to be equal to zero. So this formula is not correct. You have to make sure to use equation four. The velocity vector is being, we're taking the dot product of that with the gradient, which is applied to the temperature field. So take care to get the order of the operations the right way around there. Now, carrying on with this simple example, we are going to be building towards some important formulas soon. Now let's consider the case where we have the sensor at a fixed location in the pool, but the temperature of the pool is varying in time. So there is some time variation in that sensor, even if we don't move it. Of course, if we do both, if we have a background temperature field that does vary in time, and we're also moving through a spatial temperature gradient, then we're going to get both of these contributions, which may look something like this diagram here. And both of these contributions, so the background variation of the temperature in time and the movement through the spatial temperature gradient, are both going to contribute to the measured rate of change of temperature. So what we see on the screen of the sensor is going to have both of these contributions, one and two. And to make it absolutely clear of the difference between the rate of change of temperature measured on the screen and the rate of change of temperature of the background flow itself, I've introduced this new notation, capital DT by, by capital DT. This is new notation to make it clear that we've got both contributions. And this new notation for the time derivative is sometimes called the material derivative or the Lagrangian derivative. You can find it described in many different ways on the internet. But the trick and the way to think about this new derivative is it's the temperature gradient in time measured by a moving sensor. So we move a sensor through a spatial gradient. That's the temperature that's seen by the sensor. And this is not the same as the change in the background temperature in time. That's the way to think about this. And it's called the Lagrangian derivative because we're moving with the object. We're not in an inertial or fixed reference frame outside of the object. Now, that derivation that we've seen there is actually very useful for us. And the reason that it's useful is we can use it to derive the Navier-Stokes equations. Now, the most common derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations that you've probably seen is the derivation where we use a fixed volume and fluid passes through it. 
But actually, we can do a much quicker derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations using this idea of the material derivative. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next section. We're then going to build later to look at the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations. And ultimately, I'm going to show you that all of the forms are consistent and we have the same equation. And you're going to understand the differences between the two. So how do we go about this quick and easy derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations? What I want you to do is to consider a parcel of fluid. And what I mean by a parcel of fluid is a group of fluid molecules all together. You can imagine this as drawing an imaginary box around a group of fluid molecules. And this group of fluid molecules has a mass m. And what I want you to imagine is this parcel of fluid moving at some velocity u. We're going to be following along with this parcel of fluid that moves at some velocity u. Now, if we think of Newton's laws of motion, of course, if, there are, if there's no net external force acting on that parcel of fluid molecules, it will continue to move with the same momentum. However, if there is a net external force acting on this parcel of fluid molecules, that can be from the surrounding fluid, or it could be an external force like gravity, for example, then the momentum of the fluid parcel will change and the rate of change of its momentum will be equal to the net external force. And of course, that's Newton's second law. And the key I want you to think about here is because we're moving with the, part, the parcel, we're moving along with it, we're going to be using the material derivative here, capital D by capital DT. And the advantage of using this approach in our quick and easy derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations is that the mass of our parcel of fluid doesn't change. Now, if you think about, for example, a flow field that may be heated, there may be some heaters in the flow field, the density of the parcel may change as the fluid thermally expands when it's heated. So its density and its volume may change, but we're still considering that same mass or the same group of fluid molecules that are moving through the domain. So its mass doesn't change. We're not adding or subtracting any molecules from our parcel. And what that means is that we can simplify our equation and we can take the mass outside of the Lagrangian derivative term and that allows us to arrive at equation six. And this is a very important equation. And what we could do, of course, is we could solve that equation directly. We could integrate the equation in time and the solution of that equation uh, which we could calculate with some formula like this if we were using an explicit Euler method for the derivative, it would tell us how the velocity of that parcel of fluid molecules varies in time as it moves along its trajectory. And integrating that equation directly is actually the approach that's used in Lagrangian particle tracking. So all it's telling us is how the velocity of that parcel varies in time, but that's not actually what we want to do here. We don't want to know how the vol velocity of that parcel of fluid varies in time. We want the Navier-Stokes equations that are gonna be applicable to the entire fluid domain. So we want the variation in space as well as time. So we're gonna to have to do a little bit more work. But I just wanted to make you aware that you could integrate this equation directly. And if you did, just integrating in time, that would give you the Lagrangian particle tracking solution. Of course, we want the solution on a fixed mesh. And the solution on a fixed mesh, of course, is where we take our fluid domain and we divide it up into fixed volumes of a certain size. And fluid moves in and out of the volumes across the faces. And these volumes, of course, these fluid volumes have a constant volume, but they may have a variable mass. So it's a different way around to the Lagrangian particle tracking. The density of the fluid coming in and out may change, and so the mass may change uh, in time as well. Now, what we want to do is ultimately we need to change between the Lagrangian form and this form on a fixed mesh. And it turns out, of course, that the Navier-Stokes equations are the same and they're identical no matter which derivation you use, whether you use the Lagrangian derivation or if you just do the standard derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations, considering a fixed mesh where you consider the change in the velocity between the faces and shrink the incremental volume to zero. 
Both of these are going to lead to the same form of the Navier-Stokes equations, and that's what I'm going to show. But for now, we're going to carry on with this Lagrangian form, and then we're going to shift back to the form for a fixed mesh later on. And the first thing we're going to do, pushing on, is we're going to note that the Navier-Stokes equations in their traditional form are written per unit volume. They all have, all the terms have units of force per unit volume. So what we're going to do is divide both sides of our equations by the volume of this cell. And ultimately, this means that when we have the full form of the Navier-Stokes equations, we can integrate it over the volume of different cells, and that will uh, allow us to write our equations in a discrete algebraic form that can be solved by a computer. So we've divided both sides by the volume of the cell. And the next thing that's commonly done in the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations is to separate the force acting on the volume into two different contributions. The first contribution are the forces or the stresses acting on the surface of the parcel. I've shown these in red. And then the second contribution are the components acting on the body or acting on the volume. And you can think of the components acting on the volume as forces like gravity, which acts on the physical volume of the body. And then the surface forces will come from things like pressure and shear stress acting on the surface. And it's common in the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations to separate the net force acting on the parcel into these two different contributions. And how the contributions normally work, we normally have the divergence of the stress tensor, that's the first term, which represents the surface forces acting on the surface of the body. And then I'm using a lowercase f to denote all the body forces from gravity and other forces. And in this form, you may have seen this form of the Navier-Stokes equations before. And technically, this is the Cauchy form of the momentum equations. It's not the full Navier-Stokes equations yet. And in order to arrive at the full Navier-Stokes equations, we'd need to use a constitutive relationship for the shear stresses, for the stresses and separate them out into pressure and shear stress contributions. But I'm not going to do that here today. I'm going to move on from this form and focus on the other terms in the equation. So what we can do now is we've actually got the final form of the equation we need, but this is valid for the moving parcel. So we're moving with the parcel. If we integrate this equation directly, that will give us the velocity of the parcel itself as we move through the domain. But what we want to do is switch from that Lagrangian description to an Eulerian description, or a description where we have the fixed volume and fluid flows through it. And it turns out we can do that easily by just using the definition of the material derivative and expanding that term on the left-hand side, du dt. And what you can see now is that by expanding the material derivative, we've got the variation of the background flow field in time. That's that first contribution. And we've also got the advective contribution. So as the velocity of the fluid is moving momentum through the domain. That's this second term, the advection or convection term. And this varies in space. So if we were to solve this form of the equation, we'd have to integrate in space as well as time. And that's why this form of the Navier-Stokes equations would will allow us to calculate the variation of the velocity and the momentum in the entire fluid domain. And this is actually what we want. We're going to be integrating in space as well as in time. And what I really want you to notice from this is that actually this form of the Navier-Stokes equations is identical to this form of the Navier-Stokes equations. The, the equations are identical. The Navier-Stokes equations is uniformly the same regardless of how we choose to write it. But the difference between the Lagrangian and the Eulerian description is how we choose to solve it. In the Lagrangian form, we just integrate this directly. Whereas in the Eulerian form, we actually expand and then we consider the space and the time variations when we solve. So those forms of the Navier-Stokes equations are identical and the material derivative is a very convenient way of getting to the Navier-Stokes equations quickly without having to consider incremental volumes and variations over faces and shrinking the volume down to an infinitesimal volume. It's a very convenient and easy derivation there. 
But what I'm going to move on to now is show you two further forms of the Navier-Stokes equations, which are equivalent to the, the form that we've seen before. And you'll also see these cropping up in the literature when you look at the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations. But it's important to remember that all of these forms are identical, and that's the key takeaway from this talk. The form that you choose to use depends on the form which is most useful to you and what you're trying to do. And to show you the difference between the advective form and the conservative form, we're going to be looking at the left-hand side of the equation here, the terms that are underlined uh, with the underbrace there. And because I'm only going to be looking at the left-hand side of the equation for the rest of this talk, we don't really need to consider the right-hand side anymore. And so I'm just going to combine those together into the net external force vector F over V. And for you following along, if you're writing the equations down and trying this for yourself, you can go with either of these forms, or you can even use a constitutive relationship for the shear stress if you want and write the full Navier-Stokes equations on the right-hand side with the shear stress and the pressure if you want. The analysis will be the same. I'm just going to be using this compact form because it makes the terms easier to manage and navigate. Now, let's look at the advective form and the conservative form. Equation 11 is what we've been using so far. This is the form that arises when we take the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations. Regardless of if we use a Lagrangian type derivation or if we use an Eulerian type derivation, which I haven't used here, we arrive at this form of the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is commonly called the advective form or the convective form of the Navier-Stokes equations. And the reason for that is this term here represents the advection of or the movement of momentum through the domain by the velocity field itself. So this is representing momentum. But what we would like to do is rewrite this equation in conservative form. And conservative form is the form you can see there in equation 12. And what differences do you notice? Well, in the conservative form, all of the variables, so rho u and rho u u, they appear inside the operator, whether that be the time derivative or the divergence operator. These operators operate on all of the variables you can see there. We don't have any variables outside being multiplied. We don't have a density outside and we don't have a velocity outside uh, either. So all of the variables are written in conservative form. And the reason that we want to do that is it actually makes things a lot easier when we apply the finite volume method because we can apply the divergence theorem to these terms. But I'm not gonna be going into that in this lecture. In this lecture, all I want you to do is appreciate the difference between the advective form of the left-hand side and the conservative form of the right hand so of the left-hand side. They are slightly different. But of course, as we've seen so far in this talk, these forms are equivalent and we can use either. But how can we show that this new conservative form is actually equivalent to the advective form that we've been using so far? We're going to have to do a derivation. And if you've attempted this derivation before, or if you've searched for it on the internet, the key to the derivation, to showing that the advective and conservative forms are the same, is to actually start with the conservative form and work backwards. It's a lot easier to do it that way. And what I'm gonna do in this talk is to again start with the conservative form and work backwards, but I'm only going to take the x component of the Navier-Stokes equations. So lowercase u I'm going to be using rather than uppercase u. And I'm only going to be doing it in 2D, so considering the X and the Y components of the equation. And if you want to do this yourself, you can consider all three components and you can do it in 3D if you want. But for showing the equivalence, you only really need to do it in 2D with the X components of the Navier-Stokes equations. So the X component is equation 14. Notice that we're using lowercase u for the X component of the velocity field. And in the, uh, the divergence term here, the first velocity u is lowercase because we're considering the u momentum equation. But of course, to evaluate the divergence, nabla dot, this needs to be a vector quantity, which is why we've still got the velocity vector here. But the term that's being moved by the flow is the u component of the momentum. And the force, again, lowercase f, we're only considering the x component of the force vector because this is the momentum balance or conservation of momentum in the x direction only. And for the derivation, how do we do it? The easy way to do it is to expand 
the uh, divergence operator, so replacing NABLA with d by dx and d by dy. And when you expand the terms out, you see you've got d by dx of rho u u and d by dy of rho u v. So these are the two terms. And then what we can do is use the product rule. And remember that the product rule in mathematics, for example, if we take this first term, the rate of change of rho u in time, that becomes equal to rho du dt plus u d rho dt. That's the product rule when we're taking the derivative of two variables multiplied together. And we can also apply the product rule to the d by dx term, which gives us rho u du dx plus u d rho u by dx, and the same for the y term as well. And then what we're going to do is collect all of the common terms together. So all of the terms that are multiplied by rho, you can see we've got one here, rho du dt, and then rho u du dx, and then another one here, rho v du dy, and collect those together in this first bracket. And then the second bracket, I'm going to collect all the terms together that are multiplied by lowercase u. So I can see I've got a d rho dt here, a d rho u by dx here, and a d rho v by dy there. So I've used the product rule and then collected all the terms together. And if you need to write these down for, your, for yourself at home, go ahead and do that. It will help with your understanding. And then what I'm going to do is reintroduce NABLA, so reintroduce the gradient operator. And just looking at these, you can see where the gradient operator is going to come in. We've got a d by dx here, a d by dy. So there's going to be a gradient operator here. And we've got a d by dx here and a d by dy here. But you'll notice that the gradient operator here is applied to rho u and rho v, whereas over here it's applied to u. So what does that mean? When we reintroduce the gradient operator, we arrive at this equation, equation 19. And you can see the first bracket is still here pre-multiplied by rho, and the second bracket is here pre-multiplied by u. And the key to this derivation, to showing that the advective form and the conservative form are equivalent, is to recall that the continuity equation, so conservation of mass, is given by equation 20. And this is valid for compressible and incompressible flows. And you'll notice, looking back at equation 19, that this second bracket is actually equal to the continuity equation. So this entire second bracket is actually equal to zero. We get rid of it completely. And that allows us to arrive at just the first bracket, which is the advective form of the Navier-Stokes equations. So we started with this term in the box here. This was the convective form, uh, sorry, the conservative form. And we've shown that that's equal to the advective form. So both the conservative form and the advective form and the Lagrangian form of the Navier-Stokes equations are all equivalent. All of these equations are the same form of the Navier-Stokes equations, but we've just rewritten them slightly by using different operators and rearranging the terms. You can use, if you write your own, uh, if you write your own papers and manuscripts and you're citing the Navier-Stokes equations, any three of these forms of the left-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations they're all equivalent, they all mean the same thing, but the difference is what we choose to use them for. And if we're going to be doing Lagrangian particle tracking, then we would probably take this form of the equation and integrate it directly in time. Now, if we're using the finite volume method to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, then we would take the conservative form, which is at the bottom. And the reason that we do that is it's easier to apply the divergence theorem in the finite volume method to this, to this form because all of the terms in the equation are inside or being operated on their respective derivatives. So those are the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations. Hopefully now you can see that these forms are unified and all represent the same equation. It only depends on what you choose to do with them. And actually it turns out these two different forms, the conservative form and the advective form, also appear in the other transport equations as well. And if you think about, for example, the, the equation for enthalpy, um, the enthalpy equation may look something like this, equation 26, written in advective form. Once again, you can see you've got rho multiplied by dh dt plus u dot nabla h. This is an advective form, and that's going to be equal to uh, we have the conduction or diffusion term on the right-hand side and sources of enthalpy as well. 
And that form is, of course, equivalent to a conservative form, where we could rewrite it with the rate of change in time of rho h plus nabla dot rho u h there as well. So you can quite clearly see that for these transport equations, we can write them in advective form or conservative form. They both represent the same equation. And actually, for the enthalpy equation, you could go through the same derivation that I just went through for the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and you have to use all the same techniques. So start with the convective form, work backwards, use the product rule, and then use the continuity equation to cancel out some of those terms. And you can show that the advective form and the conservative form are the same. But hopefully taking this forward, you can see that actually when CFD codes in the CFD user manuals, for example, present the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations, they are equivalent, but the conservative form is more useful because it allows us to apply the divergence theorem in the finite volume method. So just a quick summary to wrap up everything I've talked about today. The material derivative or Lagrangian derivative, which is capital D by DT, you can think of that as the measured rate of change moving with a sensor. So you're moving with a parcel of fluid or a thermometer in a swimming pool, and you're looking at how the temperature changes with time on a screen. That's what this material derivative represents. It's really useful for us because we can use it to do a quick derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations, which is a lot more compact than a derivation in Eulerian form where we have to consider the different surfaces of an infinitesimal volume. And we can convert readily from the Lagrangian to, look to the Eulerian form of the equation just by expanding the definition of the material derivative. And we can do that for the Navier-Stokes equations or for any other transport equation as well. The equations themselves are the same and represent the same conservation uh, properties and those are some very useful different forms which you can use to represent it. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I'm really hoping at the end of this talk that you're clear on the differences between the different forms of the Navier-Stokes equations and other transport equations and you can use this in your own work when you're reciting or recalling the equations and have the confidence that you know the differences between the different forms of the equations. If you found this talk useful, let me know in the comments section and let me know are there any other parts of the notation or equations that are commonly used in CFD that you'd like to see explained in more detail. And thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.